of Invictus after watching Harry's documentary appears to be Harry is a savior of all soldiers and please give me money. That is the heart of Invictus as I saw it as I was watching through this documentary. Now in better and more capable hands, I think it could have been a fantastic representative of what this sport competition does for soldiers. However, it was utterly self-indulgent for Prince Harry at times. He featured very heavily in the first episode. He even had to introduce himself going, Hi, I'm Harry. I, I'm a husband. I'm a father. Yada, yada. So go ahead and take a listen to a little bit of this. Here we are. What's your name? My name's Harry. What do you do, Harry? What do I do on any given day? I'm a dad of two, under three-year-olds. Uh, i got a couple of dogs, a husband. I'm the founding patron of the Invictus Games Foundation. There's lots of hats that one wears, but I believe today is all about Invictus. As you watch through it, it becomes incredibly evident that there was no story here. The structure of this documentary was utterly failing in a lot of ways. And as a result, it developed into a very fractured documentary that didn't really have a message to share. It didn't really end on a strong note in a way because there was just no overall story. There was little tension. The tensions and the moments seemed to come almost accidentally to the producers. And so looking at all this, I don't know how involved Harry was in it, although he did have to put it in his executive producer credit as Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. But Prince Harry, I'm sorry, bud, but I don't think documentaries are your forte because if you had a strong voice in it, you have a big problem here because there is no story here. Now, you could say or we could delve into the fact that it might have been having to do more with perhaps Meghan Markle having a much stronger role. But I think overall, looking at this documentary, and I'll give you a lot of evidence for it, I think it was a failure here. And once again, a failure of Harry and Meghan to get out of their own way. So without further ado, let's go into it. But if you guys haven't been to Royal News Network, my name is Brittany. I provide compelling royal commentary to you all about the latest news, sometimes a little bit of the drama behind the scenes. In addition, I talk sometimes about television shows and movies like here. I also have a fashion channel and I have a membership. So actually members got a video before you guys of my videoing with my phone reactions to the documentary as it was going on. So if you guys want more behind the scenes things like that, more initial reaction videos, things coming faster, go ahead and check that out as well. I'll put a link in the description. And before we get into the main feature here, I'll let you guys know I will be traveling next week. So I'm hoping to film some content, but there's also just like, it feels like a ton going on. So we'll see how adept I am at getting everything done. But my plan is to have a lot of content filmed so I can edit it and get it out to you guys as we're traveling through Europe next week. I'm taking a group of followers, 15. We got t-shirts to Germany and Austria. It's gonna be such an exciting time. I'm so excited for everybody to go on there and I can't wait to meet y'all in person. And we do have a couple of bits of royal news. Infanta Sofia of Spain, she is officially at her high school, her new high school in Wales. That's where her sister went for her last couple years of school. We also have Princess Ariane of the Netherlands who is going to the same school grouping but the one in Italy, not the one in Wales. And although Wales I'm sure is magical, I also think being in Italy and going to school is also pretty cool. So it's a super exciting moment and for Queen Letizia and King Philippe, they're kind of empty nesters now. Their other daughter, their heir, Princess of Asturias, Princess Leonor, she is currently in military training and so Infanta Sophia is in Wales. So they're a bit of empty nesters there somewhat. So that'll be a change for them. We also have the Dutch Royals were at the Formula One races. And what was really sweet is that the King's niece, she came with them and her name is Countess Luana and her father tragically died after complications resulting from an avalanche. So she was actually with there with her uh, uncle, which I thought was really cool because obviously her father unfortunately has passed away. So that is a story I wanna to get to at some point when I do a, a video introducing y'all to the Dutch Royals, which I need to film, but it is a really, Sad story, but great that the family can still come around. We also saw the Princess of Orange, Catherine Amalia, and Princess Alexia, who is the middle child of the King and Queen of the Netherlands. We also have Queen Camilla. She recently went to a poetry event. She also went to the Royal Air Force Club where she unveiled the portrait of SOE operative Noor Un Nissa in Yana Khan, GC. And there was a room named in her honor as well. Another bit of royal news that happened last week is we had the 50th birthday party of Crown Prince Hakan and Crown Princess Metmar of Norway. So they both turned 50 this summer and they celebrated their 22nd wedding anniversary. So they had this sort of party at the palace 
and it was a fun event. Their children were there. Met Marit's oldest son could not attend. She, had, she was actually a single mom when she married into the royal family. And so it was a great time to celebrate. And unfortunately, King Harold is once again stepping back for a bit because he's suffering from an illness. King Harold has been sort of in and out of the hospital the last couple years. So uh, it's really sad to see. So I'm hoping he feels better soon. And we also have Queen Marguerite. She was out and about as well. So there's tons of royals doing tons of things. But to this Invictus documentary, and I'm gonna try to keep this somewhat brief because that does cut down on my editing time, but we'll see because I have a lot of thoughts about this. <laughs> and as I was watching through, just the overall impression, it was like a C. It was a C. And I think the huge, huge, issue here. And I'll start off with this one is the lack of story and a lack of a particular narrative. I don't know what the story was with the Invictus Games documentary. I don't know. Yes, they talked about the Invictus Games. Yes, we talked about the soldiers. But what is the story? Good documentarians, they take whatever question they have going into something and they create a story out of it. So you have a beginning, middle and end. You have tension. You have, you could say villains or conflict, something like that. That was missing from this pretty much entirely. And you had basically, I would say four main competing narratives. One that was completely dropped off the map and I don't know. So the one of the conflicts was the lead up to the Invictus Games and it being rescheduled, but that was sort of hit and miss and they essentially dropped that completely. The most compelling narrative, which was Ukraine, that featured heavily. We also had obviously Harry and Meghan, can't forget about Harry and Meghan. You must have Harry in there, especially. Meghan had a couple of brief moments, but it was really Harry, Harry, Harry. But it was just, again, it's like, I, I, it, was he supposed to be the star? I'm not sure. And then the fourth narrative as well was the other soldiers involved. And my favorite soldier was the soldier from South Korea. I thought he had a great little bit here talking about some of the shame that he's worried that his daughter may feel about him because of his disability based on their culture. So go ahead and take a listen here. All right, and I love what he comes back with later, which is this great part about how it, it's not, we can't change a disability necessarily, but we can change our perception of it. And so I think this is fabulous and powerful. So go ahead and take a listen here. So I think he's incredible. I would have loved to have heard more from him because I thought he had some of the best bits. But we, we sort of jumped from person to person. So we had somebody from Denmark, the UK. We had South Korea, obviously, and the United States and Canada. And I feel like maybe one or two other people snuck in there. But we didn't feature some of the people until the second episode. So that was a bit confusing. And then when it came to the guy from the United States, I had an, a sort of an issue with him because his disability didn't come from serving in combat. It came from a motorcycle accident. He was hit, I believe, riding a motorcycle, either that or it was a car. I'm pretty sure it was a motorcycle though. And he almost died. He was part of the military, but he didn't get his injury serving. He was in an automobile accident. So I feel like that took away some of the oomph of his story because we lacked some of that connection to combat, which is what the Invictus Games is about. No problem absolutely with him competing. He could compete, no issue with that whatsoever. But when it comes to this documentary, what is the story we're trying to tell? Are we trying to talk about soldiers who have been through combat and they're now finding their voice and their direction post going through such a traumatic experience? Or is it just anybody who competes who happens to have maybe somewhat of a compelling story? Now this guy's story was somewhat interesting. He went through an abuse situation and those sorts of things. And he also had some interesting talk about, which obviously was completely glossed over because again, this wasn't a well done documentary about how he didn't participate in sports because he had nobody to go watch him participate. And to me, that, that really tugged at my heartstrings, but then it just completely moved on. And again, it's like, okay, so, so so that should be a great point to highlight is that you have all these people here now from all walks of life, from all countries to support you. And yet you're totally 
glossing over this fact that you could have harped on. Again, I don't think it comes from having a cohesive vision to this story. And you have also within this, and I think this should have been what the documentary was about as this story developed, was Ukraine. That was the most compelling part of this whole thing because you had Ukrainians, you had the paramedic Tiana or Tiana or something to that effect. <laughs> Not sure about the pronunciation of her name, which may come back to bite me when I bring up something later in this video. But she ended up being captured right before the Invictus Games and she was held as a prisoner of war and she was trotted out in front of Russian media and they said she looked like the guy who led Germany, who sometimes you can't say his name because you might get demonetized, even if we're just talking about factual information here. Um, you can say Alfred Hiller. Just change some of the words out, put a T in there, you'll you'll get it. And so that was really compelling. And then actually their, the coach for their archery team was killed when he stepped on a landmine. And so it's like, well, that's hugely compelling. So you have one who's a prisoner of war, one who's died. A lot of the team is already actually in combat. And so, and they actually had to sort of sneak out of Ukraine, go to the Polish border, because if it was announced that they were actually going to the Invictus Games, they could become the target of Russian soldiers. So I'm like, all of that is unbelievably compelling. Why aren't we focusing the whole thing on this? Because good documentarians, like good storytellers, if you're a journalist, yes, you may have something where it's like, well, I think I'll get this story. But when there's something more compelling that comes up, you should generally go with the more compelling thing. The Ukrainian thing had tension, it had conflict. You even had Tiana before she was captured. She had a, a camera on her head and she was videoing things, getting things from the front lines. Now, I don't know if that was requested by the Invictus Games or if it was something she did on her own volition, but it was great to see the, the medical reality and the casualty reality of combat, that there are children involved. And this goes to a broader discussion of how modern warfare has resulted in conflicts coming to the home much more than they used to. They used to go out in a field and shoot cannons at each other. Well, now you can fire what is essentially a modern cannon in terms of a missile, and it can hit an apartment building. And yes, you may kill some soldiers who are hanging out there, but civilians might also also be the casualties as well. This is how warfare has, has generally changed. And so there's an interesting discussion there, a lot of tension, a lot of buildup. But then we have to shoehorn in Prince Harry and Meghan Markle walking to the stage, Meghan Markle going, oh, that's great, them having a discussion about things. And I'm like, it didn't, it wasn't a super long time and I did speed up the time so I could just get through it faster because I was like, Ugh. And And some things, if I was going as fast as I was, that means some things were incredibly long and over, <laughs> overwrought, I think, based on that was speeding up and I was still like, okay, can we get to the next story beat now? Again, there was just no cohesive narrative and then you have all these competing stories on top of it and I'm like, okay, so what am I supposed to get out of this? What am I supposed to get out of this? I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to get out of this. It feels like a bunch of random stories and Harry ending it in Hawaii looking at manta rays and I'm like, uh, with one of the competitors. And I'm like, uh, huh? Uh, uh, how? Uh, what? Uh, like my, the math just doesn't compute for it. It's, it's not well done. A good documentary should end on a note where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to see the next episode. I was honestly bored for a lot of it. And the stories were good, but they weren't told well. They weren't told well at all. So Harry and Meghan, I don't know how much input they had on this, but they really did disrupt the storytelling because you could have had something where it ended on a cliff note, but it never did. It never brought you in more. I watched it because I felt like I had to, not because I was like, yes, let's get to the next episode. I need to know what happens to X person. And what I would have done if I was doing this documentary is I would have actually focused on each soldier in an individual episode and then sort of like the Avengers, culminate them into maybe two episodes episodes at the end of them at the games and perhaps a meeting and interacting. What we also didn't get, which I think was another utterly missed beat of this whole thing and why this documentary in large respects is rather bad, is that Harry never really interacts with any of these people being featured. He has some cursory interaction with some. We see him have one sit down conversation with one of the competitors, the one from Canada. But this guy from Canada, he had made this plaque and he wanted to give it to Harry, but he had to give it to Harry's staff person before Harry saw it. And I'm like, Harry, you are making money off this man. How dare you not 
meet with him and have him give this plaque to him himself. You should have met all those people from the jump. You should have had a conversation with them as soon as they hit boots on the ground in the Netherlands. No excuse for that. You are making money off their story, off their misery, off their trauma. You should have had the respect enough to go meet with them. That he didn't do that to me is just like utterly inexcusable on Harry's part. So inexcusable, inappropriate, terrible. So, so many things. So, so bad. I just like, I was just watching that going, what now? Excuse me? What do you mean you're not going to meet with this guy? Of course you should meet with this guy. It's like, how was it that he, you had to give it to James Holt, his assistant, the head of Archwell or whatever, non-existent entity basically, for him to give to Harry so we could have this moment and then we could go down and meet him? Like, that should have been done from the jump. They should not have to ask or request or beg for a meeting with Harry. Harry's making money off their misery. Not that they're totally miserable, but you understand. He's making money off their trauma, which he tells us the media does to him, yet yeah, he's not going to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. He's not making the decision himself to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. Excusable, inexcusable, inexcusable. Okay, and one of the other points I want to make here is that why this documentary doesn't work is that it relies too much on Harry at certain points and Megan is spliced in there as well. And sometimes, Putting them in there adds utterly nothing to the documentary. Nothing at all to the documentary in certain instances. One of the big ones is that there's this bit, and again, this comes back to bite me, is that Harry and Meghan couldn't pronounce the name of this guy. And so they're looking it up on their phone. So go ahead and take a watch here. How not to give a speech. <laughs> well, at least you can read your writing. How on earth do I pronounce that? General Ono Isislim. Isislim? Do you want me, do you want me to go and quickly try and figure out? Isislim. General Ono Eichelsheim. Ono Eichelsheim. Eichelsheim. Okay. Why? D does that little bit add anything to Harry and Meghan in this story? No. No. We get Harry laughing at somebody's name that he can't pronounce. Now, we all do that because we all struggle with pronouncing certain people's names just because of the language barrier and stuff like that. Some things are just harder for English speakers and stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's reality. That's what happens sometimes, but it also feels just very, very weird that he's there doing this. And then all of a sudden we get to his speech where he makes the flub again. So go ahead and take a watch here. The global military community is coming together in a very place that is the home to international justice and peace. We also want to extend our deep gratitude to the Ministry of Defense, State Secretary Christophe Van der Maas, and General Ono <laughs> And the best part about that, in case you missed it, is Megan looking adoringly at Harry. And I'm like, what did any of that add to the story? What did any of that add? And that's a huge problem here, is that you had to shoehorn Harry and Megan into the story for no reason other than that Harry wanted to be in it. And that's a problem. One of the, the most offensive things I thought was at the beginning, Harry is talking to this guy who helped him, I think, formulate the idea for the Invictus Games and everything and the soldier he met and everything. And they're talking and Harry's walking in front of them. They're hiking outside Montecito and Harry's walking with them and Harry's in front in focus and these guys are behind. I'm like, but those guys are the actual soldiers and you're just a hanger on. Like, why are you in focus, you in front, you taking all the attention? It was all a, an attention thing for Harry, all of it. In the first episode, so I did clock these now. Granted, again, you'll have to add a little bit of time on because I did go ahead and do these at higher speeds because I needed to get through it because I have so much going on because I'm leaving the country and it's like, oh, Harry had to drop this. Anyways, so let me tell you how long Harry was on via either 0.25 times or 0.5 times. So he was in 10 minutes and 18 seconds of episode one, five minutes and 21 seconds of episode two. Episode three featured him, him the least and was probably the best episode because it focused mostly on Ukraine and that was three minutes and 12 seconds. Episode four was four minutes and 50 seconds. Episode five was five minutes and 47 seconds. Now this is not to the letter. This is not 100% accurate in terms of like, I was exactly right on my milliseconds of putting in the timer in. But that gives you an idea of how often Harry was on screen at certain points. And honestly, it just didn't work. It just didn't work a lot of the times. And when it comes to Harry, again, incredibly self-indulgent guy. So 
Here are the number of eyes that Harry mentioned. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 58. 58 times he said I. And then you look at all the numbers. He was on you know, film for what, maybe 20 minutes out of the whole thing. And he said I a lot. I did this. I I see that. I recognize X. Like so many things. He said my at least 10 times, me at least 13 times, we at least six times in instances I put because is it really we Harry or is it just you? And the best moment, I don't really want to add this in with the overall badness of the narrative. But one of the best moments of this whole documentary in terms of Harry contradicting his own narrative is Prince Harry saying that he first recognized the true cost of combat on the flight home. On the flight home. He recognized that combat was hard and that people die. Yeah, yeah. He recognized that on the flight coming home because he saw soldiers who had been injured in combat. So go ahead and take a watch a little bit of this here. To suddenly be on the way home, I was angry, but it was important for everyone around me and their safety to remove me. My own experience in Afghanistan was really affected by that flight home. And as we took off, the curtain in front of me blew open. And all you could see was the air hospital. Three young British soldiers, all wrapped in plastic and their bodies in pieces. I saw what only people had talked about. That was the real trigger for I'm now seeing the real cost of war. What does that tell us, guys? That the Bunker Harry stories were true. That this dude spent so much time being coddled that he had no idea combat was real or that people really died until he was on a plane going home to safety. That's when this man realized that, oh, maybe it is hard. Maybe there are things that happen. So the stories that he was just basically in a bunker the whole time playing video games, I think are, is mostly accurate. That seems to indicate that. Another thing that actually contradicted Harry's narrative later, which I'll go into, but just so I don't forget, is the guy from Canada, he talked about going to the games, he had a lot of anxieties, whole sorts of other issues, but what really helped him was actually going to rehab because he was struggling with alcohol addiction and that probably fueled some of his other anxieties and those sorts of things. It wasn't the games. And I think this is the thing that irritated me the most throughout the whole documentary. It's Harry's savior and superiority complex when it comes to these games. You would think these games are the magic pill that can fix all your problems. It can fix all your problems if you're suffering from PTSD because you get to participate in sports, Garth Sternit, and that's gonna fix your right up. So go ahead and take a watch of a little bit of this here. Knowing how dark it gets and how dark it has got for some of these people, one step forward, three steps back. But the longer that they persist, then a lot of these individuals get through and out of that trench that they've been stuck in. They're no longer worrying about the past. They're more focused on the future. And the effect that that has on the individual has this ripple effect across the family and across the community. And that is what we're trying to achieve here. A real emotional roller coaster for every single person. I don't know how hard it's been for all of these people and their families as they've been training. I would argue that they've had more time to train than anybody else. So I really hope the sport's gonna be awesome. The vast majority of people who have made it to the Invictus Games, the vast majority of these individuals who are alive today is because of their support network. It's because of their family, because of their friends. This week at the games is group therapy for every single person. Oh my God, right? thanks everybody. But the games inspires and encourages them. You've got different people coming with different expectations. And it doesn't matter whether it's for crossing the finish line, getting PBs, getting medals, whatever it is. These are the kind of the experiences that ultimately do change people's perspectives. It's a powerful quote in doing the rounds this week. The wound is the place where the light enters you. The very awareness you have of your wound, of your injury, of your illness, is an opportunity for post-traumatic growth. This is a blueprint of what the wider world needs today. The power of resilience, the power of healing, and the power of recovery. I ask of you to bottle the memory and the feeling of this past week. I am honored to have served alongside you. I will say, guys, I totally agree with a lot of what Harry's saying here, that yes, sports can help. But there's a problem too. What happens when you have the high of the Invictus games and then you go down to the low of home where nobody's cheering you on all the time. Things are harder, you have to pay bills and there's not that general sense of enthusiasm and, and encouragement that you get when you were at the games. So, and although there's a network that develops, again, there's a disparity between the excitement of one single event and the reality of living everyday life. Those are two different things. And, and the steep decline between those two can be pretty, pretty wild. I think even athletes have struggled with 
being all of a sudden the star to being, well, average Joe again. And so I think Harry put so much emphasis on these games and so much emphasis on how he's changing lives. He's saving lives. Go ahead and take a listen to a little bit of this here about Harry's thoughts on um, soldiers who struggle with perhaps ending their lives. Go ahead and take a watch here. And so you're still serving. 27 and a half years. My goodness. You come back and that first excitement of being home it just begins to subside. And when the glow wears off, the nightmare starts. Mm -hmm. Your husband's in My husband served 23 years. He, he died in 2019. Mm -hmm. He was one of the 22 a day. I feel it really personally because I've always felt as though every life that is lost could have been a life saved. And I think that we as society can do better, especially for people that have served their country. But what I've seen through the Invictus Games and through this community and through my own experiences as well is when you put your mind to something, that there is nearly always a positive that comes out of it. Okay, when I watched that, I just started to think a little bit. So it's like, I take these so personally. So it's like, so is it is it about their families or is it about you? I, I'm not sure which one it is. And granted, somebody else could say that. I could go, oh yeah, they're just thinking about the families. But it's just so hard with Harry and Meghan to think that they're thinking about anything other than themselves. They think about themselves all the time. That's all they do is think about themselves. And this documentary, it, you feel it. You feel it a lot. Let me go through and see if there's any other instances where I'm like, oh, Harry, this, these are not these are not the, the magic card, the holy grail to fixing people. And I think the other thing that I wanted to make sure I mentioned here, and I, I wrote this down as I was watching it, and it said, Harry so wants to be the hero that he misses the real story of the Invictus Games. And that, I think, is entirely true. Harry misses the real story because he's so busy propping himself up as the hero to everybody who's there. Because the real story is the soldiers. The real story should have been the soldiers. But Harry is so obsessed at this point, self-obsessed because of Meghan Markle, that he needs to pigeonhole himself into different aspects of the stories, even when it doesn't make sense. Again, there was that whole bit where it literally made no sense to put that in there. Why, why did you need to put that in there? It was literally pointless. And I also wonder too, looking at this whole thing, is that if they had to recut a lot of it because they ended up having to trim out a bunch of stuff with Megan, because there was that whole thing that we got pictures of, of the camera crews being there as Harry and Megan hugged somebody as they won. Megan was really shut out of this documentary. And I think that's because they got a lot of notes that she was in there too much or that they really are trying to diversify their brands. And maybe perhaps Harry got the note of, well, she's sort of toxic and nobody really wants to see her there. And I think that's totally true. So Harry really needs to have a reality check when he it comes to these games. I want them to continue. I think they're fantastic. But I think Harry is too self-obsessed with them. They are his baby, but not in a good way. He's not seeing the soldiers as much as he is a reflection of how he's helped them. So he's not really seeing them the person. He's saying, oh, I changed them. I gave them this. I gave them that. There was even a bit where he was with the American competitor and they were having a meditation session. I'm like, of course, because the guy meditates and takes hallucinogenics all the time now. And so it's like, were you ever really seeing these people or were these people a means to an end? Are these people there to help prop themselves up or to glorify you. At the end of the documentary, I'm not sure which one it is because Harry couldn't get out of his own way here. He had to be a huge part of it because yes, I understand the Invictus Games is your baby, but these soldiers should have the day in their spotlight, not have to compete with you for attention. So guys, let me know what you think of this video. Let me know if you watched the Invictus documentary, what you thought, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching. And I look forward to seeing you guys again very, very soon. Bye.